Hello and welcome to the course Introduction to Brain and Behavior. I am Dr. Ark Verma from IIT Kanpur. This is week 5 of the course and we have begun to talk about the neural basis of memory. In this uh, lecture, we will talk about the mechanisms that establish or that, uh, uh, that basically uh, you know uh, using which memory is established. Let us first talk about sensory memory. Now, it has been documented that auditory information can persist for a very short duration of up to a few seconds and this persisting uh, auditory trace is referred to as echoic memory. For visual information, the persistence is for a much smaller duration and is known as iconic memory. Now, there have been several ways to measure the persistence of echoic memory. One of the ways has been uh, the use of the event related potentials technique. We have talked about the ERP technique in the past. Now, a particular ERP component called the electrical mismatch negativity component or say for example, if you are using MEG, uh, its magnetic analog is called a mismatch field component. They have been shown to be very informative of uh, uh, or very informative about the duration of uh, the persistence of this echoic memory. Now, this MMN brain response is basically evoked when a slightly deviant stimulus is presented to the participant such as say for example, a high frequency tone is presented to the participant after being uh, after he has been presented with a series of identical low frequency tones things like pa, 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 pa you know something like as soon as this pa is registered there is this component in the brain that is evokes a particular response. This mismatch uh, basically produced by the high frequency tone is reflected in the brain response and is, uh, and is assumed to reflect the sensory processes that compare recent auditory experience in echoic memory for comparison with new incoming stimuli. Now, again as I was just saying, when a mismatch is registered, the MMN or the MMF are generated. Now, the amplitude of the brain responses at the different time intervals can be used to uh, index the duration of echoic memory traces. What does this mean? Basically, if the brain response at let us say uh, 200 milliseconds is very high, we are sure that the uh, trace is uh, still uh, alive and it is there available for comparison. If let us say we, we are testing this after 2 seconds and the amplitude is reduced, so you know that maybe partly it has been decaying. Uh, or let us say after 10 seconds if there is no firing at all or if there is no MMF or MN, MMN generated at all, then we know that the trace has faded away and therefore it is not available for comparison with this new incoming stimulus and in that sense that is one of the reasons why the mismatch negativity has not been elicited. So, the amplitude of these brain responses at different time intervals can therefore be used to index the duration of the echoic memory traces. The assumption being that the MMN will not be generated once the echoic memory traces for particular stimuli have faded away. Now, uh, Sam's, Harry and uh, colleagues have uh, varied the, these inter-stimulus intervals between the standard tones and the deviant tones and reported that MMF could still be elicited by the brain or by these uh, in the brain by these deviant tones at stimulus intervals of up to 9 to 10 seconds. So, this is probably uh, you know uh, let us say a maximum duration for uh, the persistence of these echoic memory traces, which is by the way a fairly long time 10 seconds. Okay. Now, the amplitude of the MMFs basically declines uh, from about 10 seconds after the presentation of the standard stimulus to the point that it becomes just equivalent to the noise signals. So, that you can say that there is no uh, MMF or MMN being generated. The MMN or the MMF are also informative of the sites where the echoic memory traces are stored. So, basically from uh, you know by uh, performing activities like source estimation, you can register where exactly this MMN, where exactly on the scalp this MMN or MMF are being generated and in that sense it will index the, st the structures where this uh, you know uh, echoic memory trace is being stored. What are those structures? They are basically the sensory structures where this short lived uh, you know memory trace is being played out. Now, uh, the duration of persistence of a visual trace on the other hand is very very short. It is hardly about between 300 to 500 milliseconds. Now, also it has been documented that the capacity of uh, information holding, the capacity of holding information for both iconic and uh, you know echoic memory is quite high and uh, although the duration is as you see very very short. Now, let us talk about short term memory. Uh, 
Now, short term memory on the other hand has a much higher retention duration up to a few minutes, uh, but it has a very limited storage capacity. Now, uh, as I was uh, referring to in the last class, uh, earlier models of memory, specifically the modal model uh, which was uh, forwarded by Atkinson and Schifrin long back in 1968, had proposed that information first goes uh, and gets stored in the sensory memory, then the attended information from there goes to the short term memory, and then the rehearsed information from there goes to the long term memory. Now, uh, so this is basically the, the chronology of information processing that uh, has been proposed. Now, at each stage of this uh, model, uh, sensory, short term, long term, uh, information can decay, it can fade away uh, from lack of attention or rehearsal or say for example, it can suffer from interference, say for example, being interfered with by older information okay, or sometimes even a combination of the two. So, this is basically what allows for decay of information from this uh, chronology of information processing. Now, the modal model of memory was one of the first models that divided the flow of information into these discrete stages in memory, albeit with a rather uh, you know serial sort of a structure, sensory, short term, long term. There was no parallelism here and there is no uh, you know uh, uh, provision that sensory memory can directly turn into long term memory uh, and bypass the short term memory stage. So, that uh, you know facility is uh, that. Uh, uh, processing uh, assumption is not there. All right. Now, this model as uh, most models uh, has been a matter of debate since its inception and lots of researchers have uh, supplied data through several experiments to test the various uh, hypotheses and processing assumptions of this model. Uh, one of the key questions, uh, one of the key points of debate about uh, the Atkinson Schifrin model uh, is a question like is the question that whether information necessarily has to go through the short term memory uh, to pass into the long term memory or uh, say for example, whether the mechanisms for inter. So, the other question is whether the mechanisms for information retention are the same for short term memory versus long term memory. So, these are the two questions that have been sort of asked uh, you know over time. Now, insights about these questions can come from various quarters, they have come from various quarters in fact, uh, including uh, studies from neuropsychologists, uh, people who study patients with different degrees of brain damage and experimental uh, work and uh, annual studies etcetera. But let us talk, begin talking a little bit about uh, patients or neuropsychological studies. Now, on the front of neuropsychological studies, Shallis and Warrington, Tim Shallis and Elizabeth Warrington in 1969 reported a particular patient called K f and now this K f had damage to the left perisylvian cortex around the sylvian uh, fissure uh, who displayed a reduced digit spanability, shortened working memory. Uh, his working memory span was around up to 2 items whereas, for normal individuals it is anywhere between 4 to 8 or uh, 5 to 9 items. Now, K f had retained his ability to form certain types of long term memories that could stay much longer than for just a few seconds. Let us say, uh, so hence it could be seen that K f displayed an interesting dissociation between uh, short term memory and long term memory. Short term memory is affected, long term memory is intact. Now, uh, some people can say that the tests that uh, were presented to K f were different. So, uh, sh for short term memory the digit span test was given, for long term memory word association test was given. Some people have argued that because these two tests are different, you cannot uh, conclusively say uh, anything about uh, you know his deficit uh, in long term memory. But then there are other patients as well. So, for example, um, Moscovich and colleagues uh, documented the case of a patient called E e uh, who had a tumor in the left angular gyrus. The tumor affected the inferior parietal cortex and the posterior superior temporal cortex. So, after undergoing surgery to remove the tumor, E e showed below normal short term memory ability, but preserved long term memory similar to K f. Okay. So, he showed poor short term memory for verbal material and deficits in transposing numbers from numerical to word form say for example, from 1 to uh, you know uh, to verbally. Uh, now, further on tests of visual spatial short term memory, both verbal and, and both verbal and non verbal long term memory E e performed normally. So, he is also uh, presenting a very similar thing that long term memory verbal and non verbal is safe, uh, visual spatial short term memory is affected. Uh, 
So, uh, but what is uh, basically not working is the verbal short term memory. So, that is basically something that is not working. Still, you can see that it presents a bit of a dissociation between aspects of short uh, term memory and long term memory being separately or differently affected. Now, findings from patients like KF and EE uh, demonstrate a dissociation between long term memory and short term memory. Uh, and say, for example, whereas patients like HM showed preserved short term memory. Uh, and uh, deficit and uh, depleted long term memory, uh, KF and EE show uh, preserved uh, long term memory and depleted short term memory. Okay. So, taken together uh, these uh, if you kind of put all three cases together, you will see that there is a double dissociation uh, between short term memory and long term memory and also their underlying neuroanatomy. So, because we know that different areas uh, lesions in different areas have affected long term memory. Okay, so, this is something that we will keep note of and we will come back to this uh, at a later point. Now, uh, let us talk a little bit about working memory. Working memory is, uh, is basically uh, a concept that is an elaboration of what really short term memory does. Now, working memory uh, represents a limited capacity store for holding information over time that is maintenance and for performing mental operations using this information that is manipulations. So, the content of working memory could basically uh, be sourced from either whatever you are gaining from the environment, the sensory stimulations or it can be retrieved from your long term memory. Suppose, somebody is asking you the path from let us say point x to point y in your uh, university campus. Now, obviously, if you are not exactly standing in that path and you are sitting in your room and somebody wants that, okay, can you tell me how to get to the petrol pump uh, from the bakery shop. Now, in order to be able to describe this uh, path to uh, this uh, individual, you will have to remember uh, recall the location of the bakery shop and the petrol pump from your long term memory, uh, bring them uh, you know in your working memory and then draft a path uh, you know exacting it with details like you know you have to go for 200 meters then take a left turn then again go for three, uh, 300 meters then again take a right turn things like that. So, that is basically what the working memory is supposed to do. Okay. So, the content of work as in both of these cases whether you are basically acting upon information that you have just gained from the internet or you say for example, talking about uh, uh, information that you just uh, retrieved from your long term memory. In both cases, information that is made available uh, can be acted upon and it can be processed and it is not just merely maintained by rehearsal as was sort of proposed in the modal model uh, by Atkinson and Schifrin. Now, uh, Alan Badley and Graham Hitch uh, argued that the idea of a unitary short term memory store was insufficient to explain the maintenance and processing of information over a short period of time. So, they propose a three part working memory system uh, consisting of the central executive mechanism that controls two subordinate uh, systems that are involved in managing different kinds of information. So, there is a central executive, there is a visual spatial sketch pad and there is a phonological loop. Now, this proposed central executive mechanism is supposed to work like the command center that controls and coordinates manages the interactions between these two parts. Okay. So, let us let us look at the comparison. Here you can see the uh, modal model by Atkinson and Schifrin, uh, in sensory memory, short term memory, long term memory, maintenance and rehearsal, retrieval so on and so forth. Uh, the simplest slightly older version of the working memory model by Badley and Hitch. You can see that there is sensory memory from sensory memory there is the central executive which kind of uh, sends information to the visual spatial scratch pad and the phonological loop which handle visual and uh, verbal information respectively and then from here information can pass on to long term memory. Now, this phonological loop is supposed to be a mechanism for acoustically or phonologically encoding information in working memory and hence it is regarded as modality specific. It deals with information from a specific modality only. Now, how can we conclude that this is modality specific? The evidence for phonological loop being modality specific basically started coming from studies that asked participants to recall strings of consonants. So, they were given like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, X, Y, Z, D, C, E, F, B, J, K, things like that, strings of consonants. The letters were presented in the visual modality, but the pattern of recall errors actually showed that the letters were not really being coded using the visual uh, format, but actually they were being coded phonologically. More specifically, uh, there was evidence that the immediate recall of uh, the list of uh, you know letters or words is poorer when many words on the list sound similar than when they sound dissimilar. So, that the same was true for letters as well. 
letters that were sounding similar were sometimes uh, missed, uh, not recalled, uh, confused with other letters because the sound was too similar. The same would, uh, was uh, also observed for list of words. Okay. So, basically this kind of gives uh, the evidence for the fact that even though the stimuli is being presented in visual format, it is not being registered in the visual format, rather you are sounding them out and remembering them in the phonological or acoustic format. So, this finding basically indicates that working memory uses a phonological rather than a semantic code. Okay. Why uh, phonological rather than a semantic code? Because the semantic relationships of the list of words did not really matter. More importantly, words that sounded together were uh, you know sort of confused, uh, were uh, sort of difficult to remember uh, because the, the sounds of uh, you know of these words were getting uh, mixed with each other or muddled with each other. Now, it seems that the phonological loop may be composed of two parts. There is a short lived uh, acoustic store for sound inputs and an articulatory component. If you remember just this diagram, there is this uh, articulatory control thing and this is phonologically control, phonological store. Okay. So, uh, the it seems that the phonological uh, loop may be composed of two parts one, a short lived acoustic store, phonological store for sound inputs and an articulatory component that plays a part in the subvocal rehearsal of visually presented items to be remembered over time. Okay, again, this is not very difficult. I am sure some of you have taken psychology earlier, so you might be already aware of this. For those of you who do not, just remember it like this. If somebody is giving you a number, uh, you know, their phone number to remember and they are just writing it on a sh uh, sh uh, you know, sheet of paper and just showing it to you. So, what you could do is you could either try and remember the visual, uh, you know, visually uh, each of the numbers that are there or you can just sound them out and just uh, repeat it say for example, 9839022587, something like that. Okay. So, you kind of are subvocally rehearsing this. On the other hand, if somebody is just speaking them to you, then you have this articulatory uh, that you have this uh, phonological store to maintain this uh, the sounds for a little bit of time. The other thing, the visual spatial scratch pad or visual spatial sketch pad works as a short term store that parallels the phonological loop and permits information stored in either purely visual or visual spatial sketch uh, codes. So, this is something which will basically represent information more in a visual manner, something uh, like how you would re recall a map or a graph and so on. If you remember in class 5, 6, 7, uh, when you have these geography exams and you have to say for example, draw the location of rivers, sometimes the location of uh, mountain ranges, etc. Uh, I hope some of you would uh, remember that. Uh, this is basically how you used to do it. You used to visually remember on the map which are the areas where each of these rivers or mountain ranges lie. Okay. So, evidence for this visual spatial sketch pad, where does this come from? Now, evidence for the visual spatial sketch pad actually comes from studies where participants are asked to remember a list of words using either a verbal strategy as road rehearsal or a visual spatial strategy based on an imagery mnemonic. So, uh, just you remember the image of uh, the word and that is how you are going to remember it. In uh, under control conditions in which memory rehearsal was the only task, participants were found to be better on the memory test when they used a visual spatial strategy. So, there is evidence for the fact that the brain sometimes also uses visual spatial strategies to encode information. Now, the verbal strategy proved better when the participants were required to concurrently uh, track a moving stimulus by operating a stylus during the retention. Suppose you are, uh, you know, you are basically uh, uh, crowding up the visual spatial sketch pad by giving a concurrent visual task, then the verbal strategy would uh, fare better because this uh, visual spatial sketch pad is already crowded by this task where you are asked to move the stylus. Now, in contrast, people are found to be impaired on verbal memory, uh, verbal memory task when they are required to repeat nonsensible. So, you can sort of crowd both of these two things. In the latter case, you are crowding the phonological loop by asking the participants to repeat nonsensible words. Like, okay, you have to remember these list of words, but you have to remember these list of words while at the same time uh, speaking ba 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 etc. Okay, so this kind of uh, uh, you know caused impairment in the verbal memory uh, condition. So deficits in short-term memory abilities, such as remembering items on a digit span test, can be correlated with the damage to the subcomponents of the working memory system.
So basically that aspect of uh, working memory or that aspect of short term memory that is affected can be correlated with okay if visual information is uh, affected then visual spatial sketch pad is damaged if phonological information is affected then the phonological loop is damaged and this kind of differential tests have been carried out several of these have been carried out by neuropsychologists and there is ample evidence that uh, these aspects of uh, short term memory can be differentially affected. Now, uh, is there is there any evidence about the distinct nature of these subsystems and the distinct uh, you know uh, possibility of their anatomical substrates? Okay, this comes uh, more specifically from patients who have very specific uh, brain lesions. Say, for example, it has been proposed that the phonological loop and the visual spatial sketch pad might correspond to working memory functions of the left and the right hemisphere respectively. So, phonological loop, language based material left hemisphere, visual spatial sketch pad, visual material, right hemisphere. That is that was the assumption. Now, patients with lesions of left supramarginal gyrus BA40 uh, demonstrate deficits in uh, phonological working memory, which leads to auditory verbal uh, reduced auditory verbal memory spans and the patients cannot hold uh, strings of words in working memory. Now, the rehearsal process for the phonological loop is supposed to be mediated by a region uh, called in the left premotor area, which is the uh, Broadman's area 44. Now, so in all, a left hemisphere network consisting of the lateral frontal and inferior, uh, inferior parietal lobes seems to be involved in the phonological working memory, the uh, rehearsal and the maintenance parts. However, an important point to be noted here is that these deficits do not correlate with speech perception deficits or speech comprehension deficits. So, these two things are kept very separate. Now, uh, the deficits in the visual spatial sketch pad or abilities of the visual spatial sketch pad are accounted for by damage to the parieto occipital region in either of the two hemispheres. Although the damage will be or the deficit will be more uh, stronger if the damage is to the right hemisphere of the brain. Patients having uh, lesions in the right parieto occipital region have been shown to have difficulty with non-verbal visual spatial working memory tasks like the ones that require the retention and repetition of let us say a sequence of blocks touched by another person. Suppose somebody is uh, you know is touching say for example, I have kept on the screen uh, 5, 6 different blocks and I am touching them in some order. So, 1, 3, 4, 6 or 1, 2, 3, 5 something like this. Now, if you are asked to remember what blocks I am touching and you have to ask you to maintain them, then uh, basically people uh, will be deficient if they have damage to the right parieto occipital region. Now, similar lesions in the left hemisphere uh, in the parieto occipital area have been shown to lead to impairments in short term memory for visually presented linguistic material. So, the modality is sort of uh, changing a little bit. Now, further insight about this comes from neuroimaging studies. So, what happened was that Smith and colleagues using the PET methodology asked participants to remember the locations or the identity of the letters presented on a screen after a delay of about 3 seconds. Okay. So, they were being presented with an array of locations marked on the computer screen or sometimes an array of letters and then they were presented with either the location marker for a spatial memory task and a letter at fixation for the verbal memory task. The participants were asked whether this location marker was presented in the initial array or not or whether this letter was presented in the initial array of letters or not. So, they have to look at these test, uh, uh, test location or test letter and match them and see whether they were presented in the original location or not. Now, what happens? For the verbal memory task, activation was found in the left hemisphere sites in the left inferolateral cortex, but for the spatial memory task, activation was found mainly in the right hemisphere regions, regions like inferior frontal, posterior parietal and the extra straight cortex. So, you can see that verbal short term memory and visual spatial short term memory are actually activating very different areas of the brain. In fact, different hemispheres in the brain are responding to these two different tasks. Okay. To add several years later, Smith and colleagues actually compiled a meta analysis of more than 60 studies PT and fMRI, where they found that although for verbal uh, stimuli activations were documented mainly in the left ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, the evidence for spatial working memory showed a little bit of a bilateral activation in the brain. So, it seems that the visual part is more distributed or the processing of visual information is more distributed in the brain.
this is basically uh, the task you can see for verbal memory left part uh, of the brain is uh, mainly in, involved, but for visual spatial you can see activations uh, in the left as well as in the right parts of the or the right hemispheres of the brain. Now, let us talk about long term memory. Uh, the key difference in, uh, in different types of long term memory has always been between declarative uh, and non declarative memory. So, declarative memory is basically defined as the memory for events and for facts which we can access consciously and report verbally. This is also referred to as explicit memory. A further distinction within explicit memory can be made between episodic memory and semantic memory. Whereas, the episodic memory is used to refer to memories of personal experiences, stuff that we remember about our own lives and the context of these experiences. Where did I go for dinner uh, last night? Which place, which restaurant, with whom, what did we order, what was the ambience, what was the music like, what was the smell like, things like that. And the latter which is semantic memory can be used to refer to the objective knowledge of just facts. Things like who is the chief minister of uh, Uttar Pradesh, who is the prime minister of the country, uh, what is uh, the capital of Delhi, what is the capital of the United States of America, things like that. Mostly plain facts. Okay. So, uh, we are talking about declarative memory, declarative memory is also referred to as explicit memory, explicit memory has two parts episodic memory and semantic memory. So, this is what you have to remember. Now, we can talk about also non declarative memory, non declarative memory is mainly used to refer to memories that cannot be verbally reported. So, you cannot verbally describe them uh, as to okay, I was doing this things like priming effects. Uh, learned behaviors like condition, uh, conditioning, habituation, sensitization and uh, memory for skills or procedural memory. How did you learn to pick up the bat? How did you play that shot exactly? All of those kind of things are very difficult to sort of grab, okay, are sort of difficult to put into words and describe and uh, you know detail them and that is why they are called, they are uh, uh, clubbed under non declarative memory. Now, let us talk a little bit about procedural memory. Procedural memory basically refers to memory that is derived from repeated experience such as uh, you know uh, one that gains that one gains while attempting to learn certain skills say for example, riding a bike, learning to swim, driving or even uh, you know something as basic as learning to read. You cannot verbalize the entire process of learning to drive. Okay. You cannot say that okay, I take took this step, then this step, then this step and this is how I kind of gathered this entire thing. Okay. So, that is something that is, uh, uh, is not really very easy to do. Now, amnesia studies have shown that there are some fundamental differences between episodic and semantic memories on one hand and procedural memory on the other. Uh, one of the procedures that sort of demonstrate or clarifies this difference is the serial reaction time task where uh, participants are basically made to sit at a sort of an experimental console and they are asked to place their fingers of one hand over four buttons. So, let us say this is the console there are these four buttons 1, 2, 3 and 4 and right on the opposite side there are these four lights uh, and which will flash in a, in a particular sort of order and there, there will be a sort of a spatial relation between these buttons and these lights. So, light, uh, button 1 may correspond to light 1, button 2 may correspond to light 2 and so on. Now, what happens is participants can be presented with either a completely random or a bit of a pseudo random sequence of uh, these flashing lights, which can then be repeated over and over again. The participants task is to press these uh, buttons corresponding to which lights are being uh, you know uh, flashed on the screen. Okay. So, what happens is over time normal participants learn to respond faster to the repeating sequences as compared to the completely random sequences of lights. Okay. So, however, uh, but however, when they are uh, asked they would mostly uh, report that the sequences were completely random, even though you were presenting the sequences in a bit of a systematic manner. Participants cannot decipher that the lights are coming systematically, but their pressing response becomes faster. So, they are learning something, they are learning some that there is some systematicity uh, in the flashing of these lights and uh, the need to press these buttons but they are not conscious of that there is a particular pattern here that all the time uh, 1 comes first and then 3 and then 5 they are not really or then 4 they are not really being able to deduce that. Now, this specific finding shows that while they learn to press the buttons in response to the changing stimuli changing flashing lights they could not retain any explicit knowledge about the sequence of the lights that were being presented. So, they are not picking up explicitly the sequence of the lights suppose it is uh, you know through some mathematical formula they are not being able to grab that. 
this pattern is typical of whatever happens in procedural learning or acquisition of procedural memory uh, which does not really require any explicit knowledge but people just pick up the skills they learn how to uh, you know uh, deal with that skill now while finding pattern here that all the time uh, one comes first and then three and then five they are not really on then four they are not really basically being able to deduce that now this uh, it is actually a case of people lacking procedural knowledge or it is in fact a case where they cannot demonstrate knowledge they cannot just verbalize it they have the knowledge they know which sequences were there okay uh, so there is a bit of a doubt there but if you add to that cases like hm where it was certain that he was not able to form any new uh, declarative memories but it was still observed that hms could retain from learned experience over a days over a period of days and he actually showed improved performances on tasks like driving so hm was say for example sometimes you know trained upon these procedural tasks and his performance did improve over a period of time even though if you ask them he would every time tell you that okay this is something that i'm doing for the first time so there's no conscious memory of doing that task on the previous day or the previous day or the previous day but his performance has increased so that is something that can act as a very solid distinction between procedural memory and explicit declarative knowledge now uh, again learning of motor skills uh, apparently involves so let's talk a little bit about the neural structures learning of these uh, procedural uh, skills or motor skills apparently involves the basal ganglia patients who have disorders of the basal ganglia or to have depleted inputs to the subcortical structures have shown poor performance on a variety of these procedural learning tasks further this also includes individuals who have parkinson's disease in whom cell death in the substantia nigra actually disrupts the dopaminergic pathways in the basal ganglia and also patients with huntington's disease who suffer from neurodegeneration in the basal ganglia so the basal ganglia and these uh, structures are very very important for acquisition of these memories now uh, these patients uh, you know huntington's parkinson's uh, and uh, basal ganglia deficit patients actually so def uh, show deficits in the acquisition and retention of motor skills as demonstrated by poor performance on various tasks that test for these abilities you can talk about priming now priming basically refers to a change in the response to a stimulus following previous exposure to that stimulus suppose you have uh, been to a place earlier and you have had a good experience next time you come here you automatically feel pleasant you've been to a place you've had bad experience last time you ordered some food which was tasting very horrible uh, next time you come to that place as soon as you enter the place you, that uh, that experience is relived almost and you start feeling uh, you know uh, not very pleasant being at that place okay so this is basically what is referred to as priming now priming uh, is uh, supposed to be uh, happening through this system called the perceptual representation system what this perceptual representation system does is that it kind of maintains the traces maintains the memory traces for experiences with particular kinds of stimuli so what happens is the structure in the form of objects and words and, uh, and ambiences can be primed by prior experience and the effects may persist for even months for example participants can be presented with a list of words and their recall can be tested using a word fragment completion task so i present a participant with a list of 20 words and then i can give him a word fragment a fill in the blanks kind of task okay so for example uh, for the word thoughts i can give you t dash o u dash h dash s now if you have seen the word thoughts in the list that i presented to you earlier you will respond much faster to the word you will complete this fragment very quickly if uh, on the other hand you have not been exposed to this word and if the frequency of the word is very low etc you will not be able to complete this or you will take too much time in completing this okay so this is something that uh, was done and people sort of uh, were found to be significantly better and faster at correctly completing the older words as compared to the newer words now moreover this priming effect does not seem to lessen over time it does not reduce over time it is found to be uh, very specific for the and it is on the top found to be uh, very specific for the sensory modality of the learning phases and test phases if the learning phase is in visual and the test is in auditory then the priming effects may not persist now in summary the prs mediates the word and non word forms of priming and priming is also found in patients like uh, hm who would show effects of priming even though he would not have any uh, conscious recollection of ever uh, having uh, you know uh, seen those words 
or ever having undergone a particular experience. Now, one might ask whether there is evidence for the dissociation between the PRS and the long term memories. In a study at Stanford uh, University, Gabrieli and colleagues uh, tested MS uh, who was a patient with a right occipital lobe lesion and had experienced intractable uh, seizures since the age of 14 years and at the age of 14 years he had to undergo a surgery to relieve him of these seizures. Now, this surgery uh, removed most of the early visual areas, Prodman's areas 17, 18, 19, the occipital, the straight and extra straight cortices uh, and uh, that left him blind in the left visual field. So, MS was shown to have above average intelligence and memory. MS was administered with explicit tests of memory, recognition and recall and implicit tests of memory where his performance was found to be similar to the amnesic patients like HM. Now, during these implicit memory tests, the words were presented and then masked with rows of X's. Okay? So, the word will come and then X's will replace that. The duration of presentation being from 16 milliseconds to a time where the participant could actually read the word. Remember, these are uh, amnesic participants, lesion uh, brain damaged participants. Now, if less time was required to read the word on a successive representation uh, after the participant has been exposed to this specific word earlier, it will be counted as priming. Now, this is the implicit test. In a separate explicit recognition test, participants were uh, shown the old and the new words and they had to judge whether they had seen these words earlier or not. So, uh, a list has been presented whether you saw this earlier or you did not see this earlier. So, explicit recall. Now, while the amnesic patients displayed the expected impairments of explicit word recognition, they did not show impairments in implicit perceptual priming tests. MS showed normal performance on explicit recognition, but actually showed impairment in the perceptual priming test. Why? Because the visual modality is lesion, the areas 17, 18 and 19 are not there. Okay. So, if you look at these findings, these findings show that perceptual priming capability can actually be selectively impaired while even while the explicit memory ability or explicit recognition is intact. All right. So, the demonstration th this sort of again demonstrates a double dissociation between perceptual priming effects and explicit uh, recall of uh, information. Now, priming also is supposed to occur for conceptual features rather than only uh, perceptual features, although lasting for a very short time. Say, for example, conceptual priming is also uh, uh, supposed to happen, uh, where uh, things that are conceptually related to each other will prime each other. Uh, the target and the prime can be conceptually related. Uh, and basically, uh, the conceptual priming is affected by lesions to the lateral temporal and uh, prefrontal lesions and not by lesions to the medial temporal lobes. Finally, the final form of priming that can happen is semantic priming, where the prime and target may be semantically related. Now, this form of pattern here that all the time uh, 1 comes first and then 3 and then 5, they are not really or then 4, they are not really being able to deduce that. Now, this conditioning, a condition stimulus as you know uh, from your basic psychology lectures, a condition stimulus is paired with an unconditioned stimulus and then this condition stimulus evokes what is called a condition response. Say for example, if you remember the classic experiment from Ivan Pavlov, the helper was ringing a bell before he was presenting food and the food typically led to salivation. After a few pairings of the bell and the food, the bell started evoking salivation. Okay? So, that is basically what classical conditioning looks like. Now, classical conditioning comes from two kinds, delay conditioning where the US unconditioned stimulus is presented simultaneously with the conditioned stimulus or delay or trace conditioning where there is a time gap between the unconditioned stimulus and the conditioned stimulus. Okay, so, a memory trace needs to be formed and uh, it needs to associate the unconditioned and the conditioned stimulus. Now, studies with patients from amnesia have shown that uh, uh, when people have uh, hippocampal damage and normal, uh, you know, and uh, compared to people who have normal brains, uh, they have revealed that damage to the hippocampus does not impair delay conditioning, but impairs trace conditioning. So, if you have damage in hippocampus, then trace conditioning, uh, a variety of classical conditioning can actually be affected you will need to have form a memory trace, you will not be able to form a memory trace which will associate the two stability and that is why hippocampus is necessary for this classical conditioning effect to persist.
Finally, non-associative learning consists of simple kinds of learning such as habituation where a response to stimulus decreases over time. If you are uh, you know presented with uh, high flashes of light then the uh, neurons uh, in, the, in the visual field area will stop uh, responding uh, you know stop uh, firing to that limit or things like sensitization where the response to stimulus increases with uh, repeated exposure to the stimulus. You, be, you start appreciating more finer details of that uh, kind of stimulus presentation. Non-associative learning primarily involves the sensory and sensory motor pathways. Okay. So, we will probably not talk too much in detail about these forms of learning going further ahead, but we will talk about other aspects of learning from the next lecture onwards. Thank you. Thank you.